So I've got tools and I understand how to use those tools to get me to the next level. You start running at optimal, super optimal, and superhuman, everything changes. If you are not optimizing your health, you are of lesser value to your entire client base. Yeah. the people you are impacting. What's up, Captains? Welcome aboard another episode of the Captain's Lifestyle Podcast. In this episode, I am interviewing Mr. Newts, who is the founder of Newtopia, which is this mysterious black box filled with a bunch of brain-enhancing compounds, aka nootropics. Mr. Newts has been interviewed on a bunch of different podcasts, including Dave Asprey and recently Luke Story. But most importantly, he is a repeat guest on the Captain's Lifestyle podcast. I interviewed him as well as the co-founder of Newtopia, Matt Gallant, on episode 103 of my podcast. So if you haven't already listened to that episode, I recommend going back and checking that one out first. The link will be in the show notes of this podcast because in that episode, we dive deep into all of the different stacks that the Newtopia Nootropics offer. In this episode, we didn't go deep into what each one does. I've recorded uh, other unboxing videos and update and overview videos on that topic. So if you're interested in the specifics of these nootropics, then click the link in the description that will take you to the YouTube videos and the podcast that we recorded together. This episode, we are going to talk about uh, a conversation that every entrepreneur needs to hear. We talk about the victim mentality. We talk about the importance of optimizing your health as an entrepreneur and business owner. And we also get into Mark's personal stories, which he's got plenty of. He is one of the most interesting men in the world and a very successful uh, entrepreneur. So before we dive into uh, this episode, I want to give you a word from our sponsors, one of which being Newtopia, the 100% customizable nootropics. And because we don't dive into that uh, specifically in this episode until the very end, I want to let you guys in on what you can expect from Newtopia. So like I said, they're 100% customizable. None of these, uh, you know, one size fits all over the counter nootropics. Before you order them, you have to fill out this questionnaire that asks you questions like, how is your sleep? How is your diet? Uh, what supplements are you currently taking? What effects are you looking to have? Are you looking for more energy, more mental clarity, less stress, better sleep, more uh, social skills? It goes in depth. They've got a stack for basically anything that you could possibly want out of a nootropic. And they also recently launched this magical little powder called Collagenius. Genius. This is a collagen supplement that I've personally been using as a coffee replacement. You can also mix it in with your coffee. It has a delicious chocolatey flavor. Uh, it's got a bunch of adaptogenic mushrooms in there. It's got chaga, which is a extremely powerful antioxidant. It's got cordyceps, which is good for natural energy. It's got red reishi in there. And also uh, lion's mane, which is very good for cognitive uh, benefits. It increases BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor, which literally creates new neurons in your brain. So if that doesn't sell you, I don't know what will. And what makes Collagenius different is the extraction process. They are much more concentrated than any other uh, adaptogenic mushrooms out there. They use a, um, a 100 to 1 extract for the for three of their adaptogenic mushrooms and then a 50 to one extract of lion's mane so super potent super effective uh, so you don't have to take a whole bunch of powders to get the desired effect uh so the discount for newtopia products either the newtopia nootropics or the call genius you can use code captain morgan at newtopia.com slash taylor that will save you 10% on these 100% customizable brain boosting stacks. Each pill is a stack in and of itself. And then you can stack those stacks on top of other stacks or pills in Utopia and even combine them with Call of Genius, which is what I've been doing recently. And if you're looking for that mental edge, like if you make money using your brain, if you're an entrepreneur listening to this right now and you are not on customized nootropics specific to your neurotransmitter imbalances, you're simply missing out on money and impact that you could be having in your business. So head over to newtopia.com slash Taylor, enter code Captain Morgan. That will save you 10% on the world's best 100% customizable nootropics. Next up, this podcast is brought to you by Aries. 
this EMF modulating necklace that I've got around my neck that we actually talk about in the show. It has helped me reduce my tinnitus because I was a machine gunner in the Marine Corps. So a lot of loud noises, which can contribute to tinnitus. Uh, so can EMFs. And since wearing Aries, I have had significantly less ringing in the ears from tinnitus. Uh, other things that Aries can help with is just an overall reduction in stress and inflammation because EMFs cause oxidative stress in the body that can contribute to headaches, um, stress, inflammation, trouble sleeping, uh, fatigue, anything like that. So I always wear this around my neck, especially when I'm recording podcasts, when I'm being bombarded by EMFs, uh, as well as in the airport. Uh, those are some of the highest places that you will be exposed to EMFs in your office, in 5G cities, and also traveling through the airport. Next up, this podcast is brought to you by Lambs, which I'm not wearing right now, but is my favorite EMF blocking clothing. I wear it every single time I fly, which I, I wear their shirt, their beanie, and their underwear, so I'm protected from head to, not toe, but head to groin, and it, they block up to 99% of the harmful EMFs that you're exposed to in large quantities in the airport, because if you didn't know this, airline workers are classified as radiation workers because of the high amounts of EMFs that they're exposed to. So every time I travel, I always rock my lambs gear. Uh, that does mean you have to get patted down going through security because if you try to walk through the millimeter wave scanner, it shows up as your body is made of metal because it is. Their fabric is made out of silver, which blocks those EMFs from entering your body. So opt out from the wave scanner. That's a horrible thing to go through anyways. So you will have to get patted down so it takes a little bit of extra time, but it's so worth it because especially when travel, when you're wearing your lambs gear, it makes it so much easier. You get a reduction in stress. You get a reduction in inflammation, uh, especially on long flights. I used to get a lot of inflammation in my legs and my feet. Now, after wearing lambs, that doesn't happen anymore. So head over to getlambs.com, enter code Captain Morgan. That will save you some money on the world's best EMF blocking clothing. Bonus, they also donate five meals to Feeding America for every purchase. So not only do they protect your health, happiness, and productivity, they also give back to hungry families. Next up, this podcast is brought to you by HVMN, which stands for Health Via Modern Nutrition, specifically their exogenous ketones. They're drinkable ketones, which I don't have any with me right now, unfortunately, because I freaking love them. And we mention it in this podcast, how Newtopia and HVMN are working on a collaboration to where they can combine the ketones with nootropics, which I've been doing on my own. I've been taking a shot of ketone IQ in the morning, combining that with some of the nootropia nootropics. And that has been a freaking game changer. It just lights up your brain. So to get the hookup on uh, ketone IQ, head over to hvmn.com, enter code Captain Morgan 10. That will save you 10% on the world's best tasting exogenous ketones because there are other uh, drinkable ketones out there. I've tried them. They taste like shit. So head over to hvmn.com, enter code Captain Morgan 10, get yourself some liquid ketones. All right, that is it for the sponsors of today's episode. Now let's dive into the wonderful conversation with Mr. Newts. Nice to see you. Yes, good to see you. You're looking strong, by the way. You're looking really strong. Been working on the guns. <laughs> it was. Have you have you heard um, uh, Matthew McConaughey's book yet? His most recent book, Green Light. Green Light. Yeah. No, well, not well, we're, yet. It's it's a lesson in pacing. It's a lesson in cognitive breaks, and you know where he kind of hits you in the um, right at the end of each chapter. And then he totally like goes, huh? And so you, you have a disturbance in the, in the force as you, as he moves into the next chapter and he does a great job of wrapping things up and then starting the new one off. And he does it with a totally different vocal style, tone, energy, and everything. So that, you know, that, that interrupt works really well. So it's really, really fun. But the other thing that I loved about it is I loved about it, right? So I used to do a thing, my, my exercise routine or my training routine, I hate to say exercise routine, exercise routine sounds so pussy, right? Cause, cause those of us that know the difference between training and exercise, we know that training is right. Training has purpose exercise. I mean, yeah, exercise is good, but once you start getting into training, you never go back. 
And I used to um, run down to the waterfront. I lived right above the waterfront in, in the Portland, Oregon area. I'd run down to the waterfront and then every park bench, I would throw my feet up on the park bench. I would do a set of 25 to 30 push-ups. Then I would do 25 to 30 dips. Then I would do push-ups angled up, right? So uh, incline versus decline. And, um, and then I would do some weird stretch or weird exercise that the park bench allowed me to do. And then I would sprint to the next park bench, repeat, and I would do it all the way around this, this huge moorage. And um, about a mile and a half, I think is what it was. And then I would run, I would sprint up this, uh, it was almost a vertical hill. And so it was, a, uh, it was a, about a quarter mile long and I would sprint up the hill, walk down, sprint up the hill and I'd do sets, right? Super sets of those. It was great. But, but what, what he talks about in the book is he talks about the tricep because, ah, you know, his dad taught him that the tricep does all the work, right? The bicep is for the chicks. The tricep does all the work. <laughs> yeah. If you want bigger arms, you got to work the tricep. A lot of people don't understand that. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Sweet. Huge triceps. How all are right. you? I'm I'm fantastic. I I just had one of, if not the best weekends of my life. Um, and this is something we could potentially get into on the podcast is manifestation oh, is real. Always. always. Yeah, absolutely. I live in manifestation and I laugh about it because when it happens, you go, oh shit, I wrote that down or I prayed about that or I meditated on that or I spoke that right earlier or somebody came into my life that helped guide me to that thing that was more important than the thing that I thought I was going to do. And isn't it amazing? Yes to, to both of those, to the <laughs> writing it down and to the person coming into my life. Um, this book has been helpful in that process, Project 369. Have you heard of that? I haven't, but tell me, tell me more. It's uh, it's not like a, a read through book. Like the first maybe quarter of the book is just like a summary of a lot of other books, like, you know, Becoming Supernatural, Joe Dispenza and The, the Power of Now, uh, Eckhart Tolle. So it's just a, an overview of a lot of these concepts. And then it gets into uh, the practice of it. So writing down your manifestations and uh, all of that type of thing, affirmations and, and things like that. So I've written down this specific uh, manifestation that I then manifested this past weekend. And that was the second time that uh, something like that happened. And now I am 100% certain that manifestation is absolutely real, which uh, to answer your favorite question, the most exciting thing that's going on in my life right now is that I am 100% positive that all of these visions that I have for myself and for my brands are simply going to happen. Like it's just a fact that they're all going to be achieved. It's just a matter of when that's going to occur. So that's, that's a really cool and exciting feeling as I'm sure you're well aware. Oh, I, I think I mentioned before um, I joined forces with Matt Wade and team, um, and Andy, especially, uh, is, and what I mean by Andy, especially, I mean, Andy was really part of the glue that kept it, um, that kept us coming back for more and more. Whereas Remind Matt me who was, Andy is real quick. Andy's a COO of Bioptimizers. Okay. Gotcha. And he's a huge dispenser. By the way, he just, he just got back from a, a week dispensa silent retreat. So, right. I mean, that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah. So, um, and I had these offers, multi-million dollar offers to sell the company. Um, to these different companies that wanted to acquire me. And I'd been through that before. I, I mean, this is not new to me, but- Your nootropic really, company, correct? Yes, yes. And, and before that, you know, I had done laser technology and internet companies. And so I was very familiar, a couple, you know, one consumer product, one uh, advertising agency. And so I've been through this kind of variety of different uh, companies and, and that whole, the, all those iterations. And all of them, I had had this very short 18 to 36 month window of startup, scale fast, get it to the point where it's worth something, burn out, hand the keys to a CEO and sell, right? And that was kind of my, my progression. I thought that's how I was going to live my life because I loved doing it. I love the startup process. I have a real heart for people wanting to get something started and not necessarily knowing all of the nuances of that. So that was one. And then, and then, and I had one from an old business partner that was an outrageous offer 
way above what the market value of the company would be, even on crazy multiples. But I also knew what he was doing with it or we're going to do with it. And so it was going to be, it would make sense in that. And then I had these two other offers um, and, and Matt and Wade, Matt and, and, well, actually Wade first, right? Matt, Andy and Wade came to me and they said, Hey, we don't want to buy your company. We want to, we want to, we want to expand what you're doing if you're interested in that. And what they showed me with what they had done with my optimizers, their heart and soul, right? Which is the, the bottom line. I can get money from other people. I don't need, I don't need the money. I need the heart and soul. Um, and, and it was great. And as a result of that, it just like, and Chastity and I would wake up every morning and go, can you believe that we found or that these people came into our lives, right? Because of all of the other, the con people that come in, the, you know, the, the rapers and pillagers, the guys that just wanted our customer base, the people that at the 11th hour, literally the month after Matt had seen our products on Facebook from an open box from a, from a client of ours, um, Brad Costanza, the month after that, the company that I had just spent the last 11 and a half months working my ass off to make very customized products for them that they were going to acquire the company then. They were building me a 50,000 square foot manufacturing center in Texas. I mean, these people were committed. And, um, and they said, well, the only problem is, is your product gets rid of a huge amount of the volume of the drugs that we do. And so, so we think, it, we, we think we're going to have to restructure the deal or something. And I'm going, holy shit. Um, and it was like, oh, oh, you don't give a shit about people. You just are, you and the money. And this was a very significant CEO. This guy is, uh, was president and CEO of one of the largest shipping companies in America. And um, very, so very well known, um, had taken a number of companies public. And here I was sitting there going, holy shit. Um, and, you know, it's, it, but, but that's the manifestation, right? The, like, I, I, you know, the, 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 the meditation and prayer was who are the people that give that care so much about the customer and about changing the world with with you know cognitive sciences and cognitive technology that you know that they would come in and these guys show up in my life and I you know and I don't know and then Matt goes yeah I just spent a, you know I spent 150k plus on my brain in the last few years I've been trying to do this and it was like one of those perfect things but it was absolute manifestation and I can talk, you know, I, I mean, I, this should be the, let's just make this the core of our, of our talk today is um, there's, there's been so many from the first one of mine was when my stepdad, so we, you know, Napoleon Hill, right? You talk oh, about yeah. Napoleon Hill, right? So the 17 laws, when you start talking about think and grow rich or master key to riches, you start talking about the things that he was writing about and that history. So I didn't read that book until much later, until 1992, 93. But back in 1974, when my stepdad said, you'll never make money working for the other guy, right? And I said, who's the other guy? And he said, he drives a Cadillac Porsche Mercedes. And then I got, my, I got a job at the tennis club. I begged for a job at the tennis club to meet those people. And I think that, and that was the first quadrant of how do you manifest, put it in writing, make it something that's important, Right. Make it something that moves the needle and make it something that's not just about you. Make it bigger than you, right? It has to, it has to have ripples that will affect other people um, outside of you. And then from there, that was great. Well, talk about when I was five and a half years old and the guy at the end of the block happened to be an MIT, like PhD masters in electronics, right? And that also did Xerox Park, which was the, the birthplace of the Apple Macintosh. And the, and the graphical user interface. And he happened to be at the end of my block and he taught me electronics every night from the time I was five years old on. And it's those kinds of things that you can't make happen. You, you can make a suggestion. You can, you can tell the universe that you're really interested in this thing. You can show your intent and then you, you play with that intention on a regular basis and you watch the things fall into place. But it's but it seems so surprising when it happens, right? Yeah, I want to I want to discuss what you said. You can't make that happen, and I get what you yeah, mean. Let me let me retract that. I got to retract that. I got to retract that. Yeah, you 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 can. There are 
like like when you when I think about the orchestration of events, because I, I agree with you, you you can make it happen. In fact, you are responsible for making it happen. You do the work. You you press field the shit out of it, right? You do you 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 look at at every time you see the opposition, every time you see right the resistance, you go ah aha. That's either a clue, something I'm still is supposed to point me in a, in a slightly different direction, do a pivot. It's a block that says, don't go there, dangerous. Or it is a, come on, bitch, are you committed? Right? And, and all of those have merit. You have to understand which of those are the one that you're calling, that your purpose is supposed to follow. And you have to iterate it with the universe, right? Or, or with spiritual, whatever the, the thing is. Um, I, I happened to, you know, when my wife died, my daughter and I were walking across the, the freeway, we were, we were going over an overpass right at, at the Canadian border. Cars are backed up for two miles. And, and she said, you know, dad, um, uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Like this is my, my 14 year old daughter telling me this, <laughs> or 12 year old at the time. I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> she goes, mom's not dead. She's just distributed her energy. And now we get an opportunity to maybe play with different parts of her and experience different things that we couldn't have in her present state. I mean, this is a, a young girl, right? You know, try, I, I think eighth grade or ninth grade. Yeah, eighth grade telling me that, you know, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> wow. Yes, that, that is powerful. Um, speaking of powerful, this is what I wanted to go back to when you said you can't make it happen. And now that we kind of clarified that my understanding through because I also attended a, a Dr. Joe Dispenza week long, not silent retreat, but advanced yeah. meditation retreat. And my understanding is there's two ways to get what you want, you can get it through force, which is just yep. extremely hard work, grinding all the time, like busting your balls, burning out things like that. Or, Gary v. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or through force i mean through power yes. which is what we're talking about with this man you know that book right what, what book power, power versus force yes dr david yeah. hawkins fantastic right. book yeah so the I, I think ultimately you have to find a balance like a combination of the two which if you take the power path you still have to become the type of person who deserves these things who these things will be attracted to right? Yep. What most people don't understand is, you know, they just do the hustle and the grinding, and they just work themselves to the ground without the the power version of it. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I'm sure you've done both ways. Like you said, oh. when you're building your companies, there's a tremendous yeah. amount of work and effort that goes into that as well. Yep. You know, and I think that that's a really, really important um, thing that I mean, part of the things that we try to address with what we do is that is helping people get to that point where they're they're not struggling to try to um, stay on that edge, and they're not artificially inflating their energy or their their mental capacity or anything. What they're doing is they're helping themselves uh, get into a state easier, so that and then stronger, more commitment mm. to that state of operation. So I've done brute force um, in 1993. I had been building, I started my first company in, in 95, 96 and um, sold it 11 months later. And so, uh, and I was, you know, I was, again, I, I, I dreamed about it every night. I woke up and did it. I, I dreamed every night. I mean, obsessively, I only dreamed of do, doing the technology that I was obsessed with. And I also knew that there was that the, that, that the distance between success and failure was the amount of obsession and commitment made to that thing along with it has to be the right thing right it has to be the right thing the right way is the guy kawasaki who is the chief evangelist for apple he was the guy that was tasked by steve jobs to go have software made for a computer that did not exist yet on a novel microprocessor um and so so guy kawasaki was this um a young marketing computer science grad cool guy. He's a, he's also like right now, we, I think he's the spokesperson for Mercedes. I think that's, he's like the social media expert for Mercedes among other things. Right. But, but he, you know, drives a nice E-class or S-class around town and, and uh, is the spokesperson. So, 
really smart guy, really cool guy. And he wrote the book on how they built the Macintosh, included the business plan for the Macintosh. And I don't know, I, you're a Mac user, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So in that, you kind of know the experience of having a Mac, whether it's opening the Mac or booting it up for the first time or the sound of the bong, you know, the, the startup sound and, and, all the, and the way the integration of all the software and, and elements. And then the fact that you don't really worry too much about um, about viruses and other other things that are malicious systems. Not saying that it's a perfect machine, but it's an incredibly well integrated machine. And for guys like me that don't like to spend their time buried inside the workings of the machine, I want the machine to do the work for me. I want it to be a lever, right? Not the focus of my effort. Yes. And so it's really important. So, so in in the intro to the book um, called the Macintosh Way, is there was a by the way there's a book written. 40 years prior called the Hewlett Packard way, the HP way. So, and because Apple started from Jobs and Wozniak, the founders of Apple working at HP and actually offering the company to HP when they were starting it um, and they refused uh, is, uh, you know, then it became Apple, right? So, so, so guy called it the Macintosh way. And in that he drew a four quadrant square. I'll, I'll end up using a whiteboard eventually. Um, and, and what he did is he, is he put in the upper, uh, in the lower, um, the lower right corner, he put wrong thing, wrong way. And then above it, he put wrong thing, right way. And then over to the, the other lower quarter, he got his right thing, wrong way. And then on the upper left corner, the quarter, the quadrant you want to spend all your time is right thing, right way. The difference between success and failure is people end up compromising so they do the right thing the wrong way, right? Or the wrong, or or, the, or they have a, a the idea isn't fleshed out well. So they're doing the wrong thing the right way. Maybe their integrity is good, their financing's great, their team is awesome, but they're doing something that nobody cares about. There's so much of that, right? Hmm. And the the challenge is in the best day with the best idea with the best team, building a business is hard. So, and what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to guys like you and I who are young and we're energetic and we're committed. And we, we basically, we've made our living on outworking everybody around us, right? That's our thing. That's, a, you know, at a bottom line, I was a better athlete than the people that I was competing with. And so I was able to just brute force them. When I was working as a machinist, making parts for nuclear reactors at 16, I was running across the shop floor, even though it said walk, right? Because my dad told me, outwork the owner, mm. be the iconic, outwork the owner, and you'll move up in the company, right? Because, you know, we always thought about working for somebody else, not being that guy. Yep. Right. So um, thankfully, my stepdad said, you want to be that guy. So it's really important. So, but what happens when brute force runs out? What happens when, for me, hypothyroidism attacks? Mm. What happens when you're not thinking about this, the fact that the Pacific Northwest, you don't get sun. And so suddenly your D levels are crashing, your thyroid's crashing, right? All your hormones are going away. Um, you're not realizing your bench press is going down, not up. And it's, you know, <laughs> right? And it's that kind of crap that it just kind of blows you away. And, and when you don't have, and the thing is, it's insidious. It starts very slowly and it ships away. Almost two unnoticeable. Weeks, right, right, right. Yeah, two weeks from your, from your best day training, you still feel pretty good. You can still, the flex is still there, right? It's still tight. Your gut, you can still go rip. It's, it's, it's really obvious. But two months later, it's a little bit less. And six months later, you can still, you still look better than 98% of the people walk on the street but you're far from your optimum and you don't realize how far. And eventually you're using coffee to wake up, right? You're using Xanax to fall asleep or whatever, yeah. right? And you're, you're working your ass off, but you're realizing you're only getting a fraction of what you would normally get done because you're not fresh. You don't understand how to cycle your energy. You're not healthy. And then, and then it spirals down really fast. Everybody at one point is going to have a physiological or neurological crisis. And it's going to dramatically affect them. And they're either going to pray to God that they can get out of it. Or they're going to be bed bound or something is going to happen. And then they're going to have to make a decision. What's important is, is the, you know, the next rung on the corporate ladder important? 
Is my family important? Is if you don't have health, it's your family's, you're worthless to your family as well, or at least you're low value, right? I mean, we all know people that have had that, that kind of are born with, with really bad conditions and yet they power through those and they figure out how to do it or they spiritually live above that. Um, Sean Stevenson, a great example of that, right? Somebody that didn't let his, what he was born with, it's like he's going, fuck that. I'm way above that. Excuse my language. I hope I'm not screwing up no. your podcast here. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to stick on this topic uh, for a little bit. I've been contemplating this for a while myself. And I want to hear your take on this because I oh, agree. Yeah. Everybody during some point goes through some like dramatic either trauma or stressor or some life changing event. And there's two types of people, the type of people who play the victim and they let that circumstance or situation ruin the rest of their life. Like I am depressed because of this thing that happened 10 years ago. Or there's a type of people who use that event as the catalyst, as the turning point to bigger and better, greater things. What do you think the difference is between those two people? I, I love that you said that, by the way. Um, in fact, I bought years ago, I bought the domain excusematic.com just because I had heard so many fucking excuses from people and was, and I just, at a point that you laugh at it, right? Because when you're facing somebody and you're looking at that excuse and going, really, that's the thing that you're going to let get between you and the thing that you really want. You're you really giving want your power to this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that worthless piece of shit. Um, it's, it's great. Well, so one of the things that I noticed in, and it's, this is a languaging thing that's so key, I think it is my ex my hypothyroidism. No, I had hypothyroidism. It wasn't my hypothyroidism, right? It was, it was a condition that I was dealing with, but it wasn't mine. I spent a lot of time unclaiming that, that condition, right? Not allowing it to be me defined by it or it as a part of me. You didn't and identify with that. Hell no. Hell no. And in fact, I put on what I called a, a social veneer when I was with people that was a, what would the optimum mark be in this situation? And I went into that state so that I could be the thing that I wanted to be, regardless of what my physical condition felt at the time. And, and that was part of the thing that it, I think we talk about manifestation, right? I go to this bed and breakfast up in the center, Washington, 20 miles north of me up in the hills. And this wonderful doctor greets me and, you know, and he, and he looks at me and says, you know, I think you might be hypothyroid. I didn't know he was a doctor. I was going up to get four days of rest because I hadn't slept in years. You know, I, I mean, slept well, right? I hadn't mm -hmm. taken time off because I'm a brute force. I'm a hustler. I'm a <laughs> I do love Gary Vee, by the way. But yeah, you know, hustle culture is dangerous um, or it can be. I think it's super important to do it. And I think it's super important to then once you, you like, like write out your milestones, don't, it's not just the end game. It's just not buying the jets, right? Mm -hmm. It's there's a whole bunch of steps in between Gary V starting wine library in a dark video on YouTube in 2006 and Gary V Vayner media and right and Vayner all that stuff that he's doing and having the, the income to buy the jets. Yes, that's an iconic visualization that he's got that I know he meditates on every day. I'm sure he's written it on a piece of paper. He pulls it out. It's tattered. It's in his wallet. And it says by the jets, right? Um, but but in between there, there's a million micro steps and there's a million little accomplishments. One of the things on in manifestation that we that we need to recall, remember, and support are the micro steps that get us there. The individual that we met in the grocery line that said the thing to you that was a kind thing or a nice thing or an insightful thing or a funny thing that made a, that little twist in your view of the world or in your insight, or you had an aha moment from it that then led you to the next thing that led, led you to the next thing. And being responsible for recognizing those things, honoring those things, giving thanks for those things, right? Being a person of, of high joy and high thanks for, for those things. I think they're really key. And I think breaking down, I, I think we don't do enough um, of breaking down the big picture into digestible chunks and we get overwhelmed by it. And we sometimes say, well, I really didn't want that goal as a result of that. I wanted a different goal. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Now that's, that can absolutely happen, right? The pivot, pivot is real. Pivot is good, but pivot off of what your real passion and dream is, is compromise. Ooh. Yeah. Right. So the real key is how do you manifest that dream and that vision in a way that, that you're constantly doing a short feedback loop that allows you to recognize that each of these little things is getting you towards that goal. And each of these things in its own right is a piece of that puzzle that does create some ripples. Like, like we were creating ripples before Matt Wade and Andy met my company, right? We were doing everything we could to create those ripples, make them bigger. We weren't positioned to, I didn't, this is the worst. This is the only company I've never positioned to sell. <laughs> of course. Right. Um, but I did want to make a monumental impact. My vision was to make a monumental impact to every life we touch, to every soul we, we could touch. And they felt the same way. For you, in our last conversation, you wanted to make a major impact on men. You wanted to give them a platform. You wanted to create an environment where you could help them through their, their hurdles. You could help them bring great success. And you could also help them get centered and be better men. And, and I think that regardless of what direction you end up driving this, I think, are you in Minnesota now? Yes. I love it. I love it. We're close enough. We can party. Um, so <laughs> Let's get the, I, I want the you to <laughs> Zamner juice flowing. Oh, I love it. Right. I'm, I'm with you, brother. Ah. Let's go. Oh, um, <laughs> so you need to get in a, um, in a canoe and I'll cut you off right as you get past the great bridge here. <laughs> Let's do it. So, yeah, those are those are things. So, so brute force. I, I think it's. I think the level of the level of passion and commitment, and again, obsessiveness. I think it's. I think it is a key to success. I, I do know people that have achieved success without being obsessive. They're like masters of time management and energy management and family management and life. Um, Rich Christensen is a, a friend of mine out of Salt Lake City. He's, I think he's on his 28th or 30th company. And, and, and you know, he's got I, over half of them have been successful. Cool, cool guy. Now his kids are following in his footsteps. But he was the one that taught me. He goes, Mark, I'm 100% with you on the obsessiveness. He goes, but remember, it's a pendulum. You swing it hard. And then when it comes down, you make sure that somewhere in that middle, you notch out some time for your family, friends, and your own health. Or you're just going to go from one extreme to the other, and you're going to be in this burnout. You're going to be burnout, burnout. You're going to have to sell your companies, not want to sell your companies. Mm. Mm. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> going back to, to the question, what do you think separates the people who play victim or the people who use that, whatever it is, that circumstance to drive them forward. Do you think it's, do you think it's just a matter of circumstance or environment? Do you think it's a, a, a matter of like something in their genetics or something in their upbringing? Because you can have two identical people go through the same exact circumstance. One is going to become wildly successful because of that. The other person is going to let that ruin their life, right? And I've been trying to think Absolutely. of what that thing is. And I, I, I don't want to say that it's just, you know, your, your environment or, or what you're exposed to, because that implies that it's just kind of up, up to chance. Um, what do you imagine that thing is? And it, if you don't know, I mean, it, it's a, it's a tough question, but what do you imagine? That it I, is. Well, I think I think a major. That's, it's by the way, it's a great question, Taylor. This is this is one of this is a life. This is a you get this one right, you got a lot of life done, right? Yeah. So, from my perspective, I get three kids, or I had three kids. I got two now. I got two left. Uh, trying to hold on to those pretty well. Um, is is what I, I think that. You know, we, we used to talk about, about enabling technology, like computers are enabling technology. I consider them empowering technology. I think anything that enables you is problematic because when you don't have that, you're weak, mm. right? See, I'm, I'm pretty strong even without my computer, even without my phone. I can, do, I can get shit done regardless. 
Now, these are great levers. They're super extreme levers for me. And I've been in the computer technology scene since 1986. So I've known, you know, all the way up from the original Mac with a little tiny screen. And um, when, when, uh, when, it, when an excuse, when you feel an excuse gets you more than the truth, when an excuse gets you more power than the truth and then driving, then that's when I think, I think things start to go sideways pretty quick. And that starts at youth that can start as very, very young. Right. I mean, we don't throw our kids in the pond when they're, when they're six months old and say, swim, swim or die. Right. I mean, you know, but, but there is kind of a little bit of that thing. There's the, there's the, when you've, and I, I, I mean, I've been here before many times. There's been the time when my companies have been down to the last dollar or less, right? I woke up on April 1st of, of 1991, I think it was. And my company had gone from being very successful to 20, like it was 25 or $27,000 below broke. So like instantaneously. Do you think that was just a cruel April Fool's joke? <laughs> it, it was, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. So, so it, it was for my, for, for six of my seven employees. So first I, I, I had to go downstairs and I had to, I, the basement of my home was really well set up for a technology company at the time in, in Portland, Oregon area. And, um, and so I had to let those guys go with the, with the caveat that if I fix it, please come back. I fixed it in 24 hours. So that was good. The other was, um, and I talked to my, my best friend at the time, Eric Kinney, still a great friend, still one of my technology gurus. Um, I said, Eric, uh, we need to fix this. And then I grabbed my wife and we walked around the, we lived in a nice downtown area. And so we walked around the blocks. And, um, and when I got, and, and just having that like breath fresh air, I said, I can either, we can either fold and we can accept this, right? Well, I, I called a number of the guys that had been investors in previous companies of mine. Um, and during this time, the, the economy was starting to crumble again. And so they were, they were less um, able to open their purse strings or interested. It was going to take, it would have taken, you know, 90 days, six weeks to 90 days. Anyhow, I could probably have gotten a bridge loan, but, but I wanted to, to do it right. And, um, and so in that environment, what I did was I said, I can either say, fuck it, we're out. You know, I just, I fold, I still had some money um, and we go do something else. Um, or is, uh, you know, use the excuse of, well, we'd only had one customer. They were a Japanese customer. They had multiple levels of distribution and it took them six months for them to actually engage once they bought, you know, they, they would like make a purchase order and then they would pay it six months later and they would have to train all their layers of distribution. So I could say, well, my, you know, the, the Japanese screwed me. That'd be an easy one. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and, and <laughs> that sounds so arcane today, knowing how much the Japanese have done for, <laughs> for the world and for America. But yeah, so I could say the Japanese screwed me, you know, my Japanese clients screwed me and that's it. And, and, you know, and then bye-bye. Right. I could beg for money. Oh, the Japanese screwed me and I need your money, Mr. Investor or bank, or um, this deal is taking longer than I thought. I'm responsible 100% for the outcome of this. How do I make that outcome something worthwhile, meaningful, and helpful? I sat down at my computer. I, was, I had mastered a 3D modeling program. I modeled up what I thought would be the future of laser technology, the kind of lasers I was doing for the, for the, the DJs and nightclub and bar scene. I modeled up a 3D model. I wrote some ad copy. I put it in a, I made it very, very uh, granular grayscale so that it would transmit as a fax. Remember faxes? It would transmit as a fax. And then I, I, I took a credit card and I bought a list of the 350 top um, nightclub and bar uh, resellers, the, the, the music store resellers, right? Out there. And I had it fax at night because faxing at night was cheaper than during the day. Hmm. And when I woke up, I had covered all of my negative and I had recurring orders. And so I, I turned the company around and I sold that company.
for almost a million dollars just four months later and became a third owner. So I not only got the money, but I also got retained a third of my ownership. So had I, had I li listened to the excuse somatic that was going through my head of, you know, the fuck, damn it, you know, right? All the, all the excuses and all that, then I would have just folded it. I had my employees back in two days. And right. And, and we were able to, to grow the company and make something substantial. And the guy that actually bought the company and bought me and the company um, became a, very significant. He built one of the top internet um, technology, firewall technology companies in the world called Tripwire, uh, tripwire.com, White Starns. Um, so I think that we, I think that what happens is, um, is if we think that an ex if we have an experience that an excuse will get us further than the truth, we will lean towards the excuse. And it's pretty easy to develop that habit. There's also an associated depression that comes with this. I think that if you don't make the thing happen, the thing that you were called to do happen, and you use excuses to kind of get past the finish line, one is you have, you have a dramatically reduced ownership in whatever is happening, right? Because even though you got through the finish line, you cheated to get there. You're, you, didn't play the, you didn't play by the rules. Mm -hmm. The other is that you don't know what it takes to, do, to get there. There is a backbone that you develop in getting to that finish line. And you have to, that's something you develop over time. It's something you have to go through time and time again. You've got to go through the near collapse or the full failure and then the reboot of your system. And, and I don't know if you've had that yet in your life or if you can share anything you've had in your life where you thought you were badass, you can't, you finally hit a brick wall, you collapsed and then you rebooted yourself and you remade yourself into something new. And that became way more meaningful or way more, way more than you even anticipated. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was a heavy drinker as with 99% of Marines. Right. right. I was very egotistical. I thought I was the hottest shit. Right. Um, and now I know that I'm the hottest shit, but not. From <laughs> yeah. But then you were just guessing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So big difference there. And <clears throat> on one night I was out at a party uh, drunk. The first time that I was crossfaded, actually, which is high and drunk at the same time, it was like 2 a.m. Uh, I was trying to leave the party. My friends, thankfully, uh, tried not to let me. But of course, being the you know big bad Marine that I am, I was like, fuck you. I'm going to do what I want. So I <laughs> grabbed my car keys, uh, tried to walk to my car. I would frequently drive drunk, unfortunately. Sure. And... About halfway to my car, I just got this idea that I wanted to climb houses. It was this nice little beach town community in San Clemente, uh, right on the beach. Love and it. so that's what I did. I climbed up onto these houses and I came to this one house where their bathroom window was open. So naturally, in the dreamlike state that I was in, I went in the window and then now I'm in this person's bathroom and uh, I'm, I'm very adventurous. So then I, of course, Clearly. proceeded to explore the house. And uh, so I came to this, what looked like a, a girl's room. There was nobody in there. The lights were on. And so I explored around there and then there was another subset of the room and there was a girl sleeping in there. And I was like, Oh shit. Like, what do I do now? So I just stood there for, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds. And then she woke up and she was like, who are you? I was like, I'm Taylor. We met at a party. She's like, when? I was like, tonight. She's like, no, I, I didn't go to any parties tonight. I was like, oh yeah, it was last night actually. She's like, nope, I don't know who you are. I'm going to call the cops. And I was like, that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to leave. And so I went back out the bathroom window, same way I came in jumped down to the sidewalk, started booking it back to my car. And then I was like, you know what? That was really weird. I'm going to go back to her and apologize. Except this time I'm going to do it via rooftop. So now I climbed onto the roofs of these beach houses 
and proceeded to jump rooftop to rooftop back to this girl's house, you know, landing shingles shattering at like 2 30 AM causing a rush. Yeah, yeah. They must've thought it was like a, a meteor hitting their house or something. And um, I came to this one gap that was pretty significant. And again, I'm thinking that I'm in a dream and that I can do whatever I want. Nothing's going to harm me. So I made the jump to the other side, but when I landed, there was this loud pop and that thankfully sobered me up. I was like, okay, I'm not in a dream. I just fucked up my ankle. It, it's time to call it quits. So I lowered myself back down into their backyard, out the gate, hobbled the rest of the way back to my car, woke up at about 7 a.m., drove back to base with my left foot because it was my right foot that was broken. I didn't know it was broken. And um, yeah, that that moment was the turning point to turn my whole entire life around because I was like, Taylor, you can either keep going down this path of of not living up to your highest potential drinking every weekend playing video games in your spare time or you can use this time in a cast to better yourself so i started listening to podcasts i started reading which before that i had never read a book like oh really school, like no yeah never read a book i i hated it so i started reading taking online college courses working out even more uh, that was a time when i learned to handstand walk so I was like, if I can't walk on my feet, I'm going to learn to walk on my hands. So I, I don't think I've ever had, well, of course I've had the victim mentality, but not super ingrained. So I use that point to grow. And you're absolutely right. I can pinpoint most of my success towards that moment. Like if that wouldn't have happened to me, who knows where I would be right now. Right. What so was your, what was your, what was your career in the, in the uh, military? I was a machine gunner. Okay. So just big, dumb, brute force, you know, make shit happen. Um, so yeah. How are your it, ears? How are your ears today? I have tinnitus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same. So ring in the ears sometimes. That has been reduced actually since I started uh protecting myself from EMFs. So yep. that's gone down. So that's why I wear this Aries thing. Um, so there are things to do, but um Going back to what you were saying, I do think that the elimination of the victim mentality is the primary driving factor between these events, whether we let them ruin us or whether we let them, you know, project us into bigger and better things. Speaking I, of which, I, I, I would love to introduce you to uh, Mark England. He's the founder of the Enlifted Method. He's uh, huge on the victim mentality. Um, I just finished up the level one certification uh, through the Enlifted method. And it's all about language, understanding that the words we use both internally and externally are legitimately casting spells. The definition of a spell is a word or combination of words believed to hold great meaning or influence. And based on the words that we choose, we can either cast good magic or dark magic. Right. So in the victim mentality, we're casting dark magic. We're projecting onto this person made me feel this way. I'm stressed out because of this situation, giving up all of right, our right. Power. Because of right, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you guys would get along. Um yeah. I I'll I'll hit him up, see if he can um reach out to you. Have because they have a podcast too. I think that would be uh, a fantastic love that episode you know when i was when i was young um i think i mentioned this before on one of our get togethers is um i had a very contentious relationship with my stepmom when i was young and she i i felt and i don't know how much of this is real because when you're a kid there's a distortion of reality but your lens isn't very sharp mm -hmm. your brain is definitely not not in alignment with with it um but uh, I've really felt a negative kind of energy around her. Um, today, she and I are very good friends. But um, when she would come home from work, after I had, I would come home from school, I would take a bong hit, and then I would listen to a stack of Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and, and Aerosmith and Doobie Brothers albums. And then I would hear her come in the door about an hour and a half later from work and, um, and go into the master bedroom. And I would sneak out of the house. 
and I would go running from, I would, I'd walk two blocks to the high school or to the junior high and I'd go running towards the high school, which was a mile down the way. So I would take this whole loop was a little over, it was like two and a quarter miles or so. And I would start running. And in, again, Pacific Northwest, it's always rainy or it's foggy or it's, <laughs> it's cold. If one way or another it's cold. And, um, and this is even before there were Nikes. I was wearing, I think, Tiger, Onitsuku Tiger's shoes um, or Blue Ribbon Sports shoes. So the, the, the predecessor to Nike. And, and I would get out there to the road and I would just, I would point myself at the high school and I would start at a, at a pretty fast jog. And then every time I hit a street light, which was every two blocks, I would go, you're the fastest guy in school. You're the smartest kid you know. You're, the, you're gonna be super successful. And we were very blue collar. We lived in a, in a very blue collar little ranch house. My dad was a very hard worker, but the job that he had did not equate to the economics that he should have received. He became very successful later on, many years later, decades later. Um, he became a multimillionaire actually. Um, and from 1987 to 1990, he became a multimillionaire. In that three year period, all, all of his wealth was accumulated then. Just super, super great guy. But, but it was interesting because when I got home, then my stepmom, I you know, always felt like everything she said had a, had a bit of negative connotation to it. But that drilling that positive voice into myself, even though it was my own voice, I had no idea where it came from. Some of it came from song lyrics. Um, some of it came from like from Rush and Zeppelin. And I would find songs that made that had meaning um, and use those as kind of my driving beat. But that made such a huge difference. And when I was, uh, so that was in seventh uh, or, or, or fifth, sixth and seventh grade. And then um, by the time I hit 10th grade in school and I dropped out after my 10th year in high school um, is is had I not developed that crazy thinking, because it was crazy at the time to think that I would be successful, to think I'd be super fast. I was this uncoordinated, gangly, six foot three, or, or not at the time that I was probably five, eight at the time, or five, 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 six, five, seven. Um, and I, in fact, they even gave me an award. This is so classic. This is the beginning of the end, right? They gave me an award as a track runner in seventh grade. I took, I did every event in track. I did hurdles, I did 100, I did the 220, but back then they didn't have the 200, it was all right yards and feet. I did 220, 440, I did the half mile, the mile, the half mile hurdles, quarter mile, or the, the mile hurdles, and, um, and, they gave, and, and then high jump. Um, and they gave me the award for most events participated in, even though I was, <laughs> but I, was I, I got pretty fast though, I got pretty fast, so, so it was great. But I think that that, that kind of piece that I started when I was, you know, in fifth, sixth grade became a mantra for me later on when I was beating myself up later on in life about, you know, dropping out of high school, right? You're an automatic failure. Um, even though I just, I almost aced my GED and, and going in the military, Air Force for me. Um, and I was, I was in Central California. So I, and, and later on in Merced, uh, or you know, I was in Merced, Atwater, Modesto, Fresno, when I was in the military. And then when I get out of the military, I moved back to Portland. Then I moved to Newport beach, California. So, and my, my, the company that the CEO of the company that I ended up getting acquired by lived in San Clemente. So, so I spent quite a bit of time there. It was great. Mm -hmm. And you're right. And those are all, those are all tile roofs. Yep. <laughs> they, they shear when you hit them. Yeah. Um, I think that that I, I firmly believe that that rewriting of our script is a key to our success is even if you, even if you go, like, I remember one time when I was in 10th grade, dealing with my own self-esteem challenges and writing my script, I rewriting my script again, going, and I was a tennis player and I was a very good competitive tennis player. And I was a, you know, state competitor. Um, Luke story in a recent podcast I did with him, he pulled out the part where I talk about being on mushrooms and, <laughs> and playing state tennis. It was pulled out, but it was that, it was that, um, I had to create a bigger picture of myself than I really was. So I had something to step into. I had a picture to step into before that point, everything said you need to shrink. Right. And 
so because everything said you had to get smaller, you had to be less important, you had to be less valuable, you had to be, you, you weren't, you, did, you didn't have the formal schooling, you didn't have, you, you know, you weren't, I was, I was, you know, voted one of the three least likely to succeed in my class, mm. announced over the intercom at school, in high school. I mean, that's an ugly thing to have happen, right? Wow. So. Yeah, yeah. My my best friend at the time, Toilet, is his, his nickname, Steve Johnson, who we just we had just had a, a little chat today. It was great. He's he's great. We we got in touch again. Ex military as well. Um, a competitive skier for the Air Force. How's that? What's your wow. job in the Air Force? I'm a competitive skier. <laughs> That's the life right there. Well, here's another one. Do you know the band Cheap Trick? Have you ever heard of the band Cheap Trick? They're, I don't think they're so. An, they're an old pop rock band from the 70s and 80s who ended up going to Japan and doing so well at Budokan in Japan, they just stayed in Japan for like 10 years. So <laughs> they just made so much money. They would, you know, cause the Japanese were just obsessive with, with their music. So um, this guy, a guy named uh, Jay Gilbert was uh, emancipated when he was 15, lived in his own little tiny shitty apartment in Salem, Oregon. And like literally had, had food stamps to live off of. Right. And, and, you know, did like, like he would go to school, pick up the, his books and the assignments, go home, do the books and assignments, then had his job. Um, he was built like you are just naturally at 15, 16 years old. Jay was one of the guys that I was like, Jay, Jay and I thought we were going to be road, you know, the chances are we were going to be roadkill. Now we didn't believe we were going to be roadkill, but everybody around us looked at us and said, there's no way these guys are going to make it. These guys are the right. And we, you know, and, and though Jay didn't drink because his parents were alcoholics, I was really good at pounding him. I could, you know, I was the guy that was the, I was the party favor at parties would get so wasted, puke my guts out, come back in and get wasted again. Right. You know, I'd like recharge, yep. you know, they would take the pitcher of beer. They would drop the 12 ounces of Everclear in it or, or, or one fifty one. I would chug it. Right. Woo! Right. That was my big client, you know? Yeah. Um, I could clear a six foot bong. That was, <laughs> that was my, my real tribute. So, you know, really, really self-destructive stuff that we do when we're stupid and young uh, or innocent. Let's call it innocent. Can we call it innocent? There we go. Um, but, but it was that, that scripting that we, that we kind of dove into. Um, one day we were at a, a, at a grocery store, Jay and I were, and, and I was a super skinny kid, right? Like super skinny. And Jay, Jay was built like you are. And I just, but he never worked out. He didn't train. He did a little bit of, of calisthenics, right? He did body weight workouts, but nothing hardcore, just enough that he didn't get soft. And I remember, I remember just like doing a, a running shoulder push into him. And it was just, <clears throat> he's just like, I think I, I swear I dislocated my shoulder. He was just solid. And he looked over at me like, like, yeah, motherfucker. You think <laughs> you can get some on it? <laughs> Jay is, so I, I mentioned the early part. So Jay wanted to be a singer in a band. Like, don't we all want to be a singer in a band one day, right? Or lead guitar or lead mm -hmm. or bass or drums, whatever it is. And, um, and he, there's a, there's a guy named uh, Xander, some, Xander, uh, uh, but he's the lead singer of, of this, of that band. And, um, and Jay could emulate him to a T. Jay became the lead singer in a band Jay became a successful manager of bands. Jay, I think maybe even toured with them for a while. I can't remember. Jay now has, and has for the last 20 years, had one of the top um, emerging musician production, you know, producer, studio, and tour management companies in Hollywood. Jay, the guy that was going to be the loser. Got Jay, the guy that should have been, right? Jay's head is there. Jay has always believed that we were bigger than our circumstance, that we were not victims to our circumstance. The circumstance were a thing that we looked at. We kind of put it out here and said, oh, that's, that's that thing out there. That's not us. That's that thing that's going on out here. And he, he didn't identify with a label, just like no. you and I, you know, we, <laughs> he we became, don't... it's, it's so funny because as a movie, a music producer, right? He is the label now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Uh -oh. oh, your lights, your lights fly out. Yeah, I don't know. One did the rest are on. So I, I don't know what happened there. But uh, we improvise the adapt excitement, and overcome I, the excitement of the energy that we just did. 
caused an electrical spark. I love it. That's it. The so, Spenza would agree. Yeah, let's uh, let's pivot a little bit. I want to uh, because I'm going to make the this podcast title a conversation that every entrepreneur needs to hear. Oh, because really, the what separates a good entrepreneur from or not a good, but a successful entrepreneur from a unsuccessful entrepreneur is, I think, the same thing we've been talking about, this victim mentality and not identifying with a label, not letting a failure dictate how the rest of your life is going to go. So um, I want to take it back to something you said earlier, um, like with the quadrant thing, doing the right thing uh, the right way. I've been saying this for the past two years, really since I started my coaching program, mm -hmm. that CEOs of the future need to care about three things. They need to care about their own health, happiness, and productivity, because that is obviously what's going to lead to everything else. If you as a CEO are not optimized, your business isn't optimized, right? So you, can't, you can't be operating on a lack of sleep. You, I mean, you can, but it's always going to be maximized if you take care of yourself, right? Right. So they have to care about themselves. They have to care about the health and wellness uh, and well-being of their employees, right? The CEOs Absolutely. of the past who, um, you know, treat their employees like shit and, you know, degrade them and they don't care about their family life or what they're going through, their mental health, those days are over, right? Employees now, they want to work for a company who truly cares about them, right? Absolutely. So care about themselves, care about their employees. They also have to care about their impact that they have on the environment, the uh, their community, other people, some aspect of positive impact, right? So it's got to be a combination of those three things. And I just want to hear you go into a little bit about your experience, um, like with the company who was going to buy you, you found out that they were only interested in the money. That's a very yep. clear sign that the CEO did not care about, you know, their actual impact. They were just in it for, for greed. Yep. And they were, and they, um, they are, uh, the largest importer of a substance, a legal substance, marginally legal that, um, can cause, it, it can be a incredibly powerful healing tool, or it can be the death of an individual. Hmm. Okay. So, so the reason I got involved is I knew how to make that that solution of theirs, that that imported um, herbal extract. I knew how to make it very powerful on a fraction of the dose, make it non-addictive and make it um, so you didn't build tolerance so that you could take it again and again and never have to have more and more and more. Mm. So that's, that's what I was doing. That's what they wanted. Correct. Yeah, they wanted they wanted addicts that, that took more grams every day in order to, to feel, right? So I love, by the way, I, I'm hundred, I'm more than hundred percent in agreement with your, um, the scope that you just shared. I think that's super important. In fact, um, we address this on a, on a weekly basis with my meetings with, um, with our management team is how do we, how do we be, um, better with the farms that we work with that, that grow the stuff that we extract and the rest, how do we make our packaging more green and how do we make it so our, our employees are, absolutely taken care of so that one, I mean, there's a thing called the glass door reading glass door reading is, is mm -hmm. corporations, right? They have glass door reading. And by the way, just um, as an, as a sort of a side, but also a reflection of, of, um, of kind of our congruency, we'll call it congruency is um, we're, we've just been announced as the 245th fastest growing private company in America. And a number seven, I think on, uh, in the health and wellness space. So I yeah. saw that. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank, thank, I, I wish, I wish I could take credit. It's so funny. I've, this is my second time I've hacked the Inc 500 through acquisition. So back in, back in 86, when I sold my first company, um, the next year we became 387th, um, fastest growing private company in America through the, of the Inc 500. And then here we are again. And so I did it. You had to be in business five years. I was only in business 11 months at that point. And so same thing here. Uh, this time I'd been in business for, you know, over 10 years. And, um, and when they picked it up, or 10 years exactly, and they picked it up and became Inc. 500. So it was kind of, kind of great. But, but here's, here's uh, let, me, let, me, um, let me share with you a maxim that has followed 
followed me around since 1985, 86. My brother and I, my brother, Doug, who's an amazing human being, he and I started um, our first company uh, We hit called Technology Incubators. Funny, because I've run a, a number of technology incubators since then. Is um, and, uh, and in that, we were kind of looking for a grounding rod for the company. And I found it one day. I, I love the way that words sound. I love phone, what are called phonemes or phonetics of, of sounds, right? What, mm-hmm. what letter combinations, the sounds they make as you're speaking them or is there, right? So kind of like rhyminess. So the one that came to me was called Fun, Fame, and Fortune. And it's still something that I, I live by in my, my companies I've fueled by. And that sounds very, uh, uh, very egotistical or arrogant. And it's not, let me assure you, it's not. Here's what I mean by that. Because definition is everything, right? Is fun, fame, and fortune means fun is making sure that our employees are doing the thing that they are absolutely great at. Because when you're doing something you love to do that you're great at, you're having fun, right? Yep. You, you get into flow state, you get into joy. You can't wait to get to work. You think about it when you're not at work, right? When you're not in the office, um, when you're paddling down the Mississippi to come see me, you're, you're thinking, yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's it. So fun was the first thing was, was, you know, making sure that we were hiring based on people's genius. Matt calls it their zone of genius mm-hmm. and, um, and the thing that they were passionate about and they were absolutely infatuated with. When Matt said, do you want to sell your company in July of a couple of years ago, almost three years ago now? Um, I said, no. And he goes, great. That's what we want. We want somebody that doesn't want to leave. You're not, you're not doing a cash out. Um, we want somebody that wants to go change the world. And, you know, and that's, I was called to do this work. So um, I feel it's really important that I follow through with that calling. So that's the fun. Fame is recognizing our employees for their contribution they make to the company. I don't have such a big ego that I want to, to take credit for everything that happens. I want my employees to get their due credit and more. Mm-hmm. And we do contests very frequently now because we're l- releasing a lot of new products where we compensate our employees for coming up with a great name for a product or for a tagline or for a flavor or things mm-hmm. like that. We have other competitions inside and it's not just monetary contribution, but, but obviously money goes a long ways um, w- with people. Right. So, and I think it also says I'm worth something, right. It's self-worth. There's, there's amazing thing. A lot of our, our employees work in different countries. We have a, a very distributed workforce. So if you're in the Philippines, a reward of a thousand dollars can go a lot farther, right? Yeah. That's like a 5,000 or $10,000 reward in America. Yeah. So domestically or in Canada. So things like that, but, but it's really important to recognize them, but it's super important also to recognize the contribution our customers make, right? Like giving them, putting them on a pedestal and saying, Hey, this, cause our customers change our lives. I mean, not just the fact that they, they, you know, they, they exchange their hard earned money for our hard developed stuff. But there are also that exchange of insight and input and care and love. Mm. I get, and I, I thrive on these. I get texts every day. I get texts from clients I've had for a decade or more, including people in my early prototypes before I even released product saying, thank you so much for making something that got me off drugs or helped my Crohn's or, or, you know, did whatever, whatever the thing is doing for them, got me off Adderall. And that's been, I mean, it's, you know, warms your heart and it realizes that you're not just, this is not just an economic mill that we've created. No, this is a people affecting life changing life affirming thing that we get an opportunity to be the conduit for. Right. I mean, it's not, if I didn't do this, somebody else was going to do this. Yep. Right. The universe was going, all right, (laughs) I'm, I'm, I'm on the lookout. Who's, who's it going to be? That's going to fill that spot. Because we certainly didn't, you know, for the, especially for the first few years, it was not something that was profitable beyond my own consulting on the side, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the, that the side hustle, um, you know, is, is super important to have the hustle going on while you're doing your side hustle, right? <laughs> and then the last part of that is fortune. And fortune is making sure that you're creating something that will eventually have enough economic impact to you, your employees, and your, your future development that you can create a sustainable enterprise. Otherwise, mm-hmm. the thing that you just created that is positively impacting tens or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people 
or millions of people, hopefully, yep. won't have the horsepower to serve those people after a given amount of time. Or you'll get so burned out because you're not, you know, you haven't created a profitable enterprise. Yep. And people don't understand the margins you need to be profitable. I mean, it's not something that just happens. You've got to build for it. You've got to, you know, when I first did our, our products, um, I just had to, I just said, all right, I'm going to price it at this. I know that this is uh, significantly above the cost of the raw components, but I know that eventually I'm going to have to have affiliates and I'm going to have to have channel and I have to build websites and I'm going to have to do further development and I'm going to have to build a customization engine and all that stuff. And those were going to cost money. And unless I wanted to go, you know, work my eight or 10 or 12 hour job and then come back and do this and burn out, right. Yep. And lose my kids in the process and lose my health and everything else. I was going to have to figure out a way to make it profitable. So fun, fame, and fortune. Those are like super important. Love that. Um, so <clears throat> with that, there's two places I want to go with this. Let's stick with this one. You mentioned earlier in, in the episode that if you are not healthy, you provide no value or minimal value to your family. Same thing applies to your company. And if your company is in the business of making a positive impact, if you are not optimizing your health, you are of lesser value to your entire you know, um, client base. Yeah. The people you are impacting. The so ecosystem. if you're neglecting your health, if you're not charging enough money, if you're not making enough money to take care of yourself first, if you're burning out, then think of all the other people who aren't benefiting from right. that. Like who is benefiting from your lack of health? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> so talk when about the, when... how, let, let's talk about how you personally optimize your own health, happiness, and productivity. So then you can continue bringing this positive impact. I love that. I love that. And, and, you know, this is such a, a trite maxim that's been used for years, but it, it really is. You, you know, when the plane's going down first, you put on your mask, right. And then you give it to your child or loved ones, right. You got to do that. And I didn't understand that at first. I thought it was very selfish for me to, to go run. You know, at one point I was that my, my uh, training program had had kind of decayed down to running every other day or every three days, you know, once every three days on, at the worst. And, um, and that's, that was also a clear indicator that my health was decaying. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause I was, I was like, Oh, well, I, I don't need to work. I don't need to train today. I can train tomorrow. And you know, of course, tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow um, is where 99% of hopes, dreams, aspirations, actions lie it's this <laughs> mythical place that everybody puts their their action steps in is tomorrow and then tomorrow comes and then what happens you don't feel like it and then oh i'll do it tomorrow and tomorrow and i'll do it sometime yeah right the nebulous the nebulous tomorrow so i'm gonna i'm gonna let me go back just a, one step in this conversation you know um one of the things that have been complaints from from the socialists out there <laughs> One of the one complaint that's that's been uh, I frequently hear. I was I, I just finished Jordan Peterson's uh, uh, conversation with Lex um, uh, last night. It was fantastic. If you want to if you want to immerse yourself in a spiritual conversation that uh, that will impact every part of your life, that's a, that's a great one. Jordan Peterson well, on Lex. for everybody listening, we will link to that in the show notes. Dig it, dig it. So, um. Yeah, so a, a corporation, a company, a business, a startup, uh, an LLC, um, the first, I, uh, Guy Kawasaki says, the first thing you do when you start a company is you make the t-shirt, right? Because, I mean, because that, you know, that's kind of like one that we made one thing, we created one thing. Now let's create the company that that, that t-shirt represents, right? Mm. And for me, it's a business card. I, I, I literally go out of my way to make beautiful business cards when I start, just so that when I, so that when somebody says, what do you do or who are you? Boom. <laughs> and I'll show you the next pill. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, 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 that's a real pill, man. That's an incredible nighttime antidepressant. Um, I can't say antidepressant mood enhancing. There we go. Um, right. Um, but, but it's super important because it rep, you know, once you do that, you go, oh, wow. It, it kind of gives you this iconic piece that you 
then create a company to fulfill the promise of that business card or that t-shirt. You know, I just made these, right? Mind, body, energy, sex, and sleep, right? Yep. Love it. You know that, you know that there's a the Morgan all over it, man. So the captain, listen, so core, uh, your, your business, even if it's you and you haven't done an LLC yet, you don't know how the hell that they put those together. It doesn't matter. The minute you decide to step out and create something of value, you've created an, a living, breathing entity. And you have a responsibility to that entity to keep it alive. Right? Especially as you start engaging clients and customers, and they have a, you have a, a, a relationship with them. I hate to say codependence. That's an awful term. Interdependence. But you do have, right. Interdependence. Thank you. Covey 101, man. So you have this interdependent relationship with them. And it's super important that you support that entity. And so, so we fast forward to that, to your health and wellness, right? Things like, like I have been doing a form, a, a, a micro form or fractional form of TM, Transcendental Meditation, since I was eight years old. That's when I first learned it. Okay. So, and I do, a, I do a thing called box breathing where I, I breathe in, I count my heartbeats as I'm breathing in because counting gets your head out of your head. Yep. Right. You can't have another thought while you're counting. So um, that was a little trick I learned when I was eight years old. And, um, and then you, you know, you hold it at the top until you almost feel the pressure. And as you feel the pressure, so you're counting your heartbeats again, your heart's going slower and slower and then it starts speeding up because, right, because mm -hmm. carbon dioxide is starting to build and you're getting that response mechanism. Then you breathe out and you do the same thing. Okay, you're counting your heartbeats on the way out. And then at the bottom, you hold at the bottom. So you kind of feel that urge to breathe in while you're counting your heartbeats. Huge, huge deal. You can go under, you can get into a, a meditative state in one to three minutes using that box breathing technique. I use that. I try to use it every morning. Um, I, I try to do a 20 minute meditate. It sounds silly. You just woke up from a six or seven or eight hour sleep and what you're going to sleep again. No, that's the best I'm, time to do it. It is, man. It is incredible. I am organizing my, I am, I'm letting my brain put into place all of the different moving parts and I'm problem solving for the day. So I'm meditating on the most important people in my life, the things that I am most thankful for, right? The biggest love and accomplishments that I want to make and the change that I was called to do. So I do this kind of systematic series of events like that. And it, it gets me out of my own ego and into purpose. Mm. People say, why, what drug killed your wife? I said, drugs physically killed my wife, but lack of purpose, lack of hope killed my wife, mm. right? When she no longer, when my kids were self-supporting, she no longer, like she got up and they were already making their own breakfast in the morning, right? Then she lost her purpose. And with that purpose, she didn't move the needle forward and go, okay, I got I to gotta move this down the field a little bit because I need to create a new purpose. Even if it's me, she could have created one that was just her. Something to get her out of that, to get back into what, what is purpose, right? Yeah. So that's it. So then I, I like to get, I do a, a thing called EWAT, exercise with oxygen therapy. Mm -hmm. Super critical for me. Um, one is I've got, I've got the remnants of this, this drug that I took when I was young, not a drug drug, but a, a pharmaceutical that I was a, a test case for. Um, and so it has, it has pro tumor qualities. Accutane, so right? Accutane. Correct. Yeah. Really, really nasty shit, man. Don't recommend it to anybody. Um, so I do uh, an EWAT. I'll do a, a 20 to 30 minute EWAT, um, in the morning. And then I don't do it every morning, but I'll do it like three times a week, four times a week. 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. And then I'll go out and I'll take my dog to the graveyard, right? Because he likes to, he can sniff dead people. <laughs> <laughs> likes to dig up the bones. He does. He does. <laughs> great. It's great. And, and we play Frisbee and, um, and it gives me a chance to run a bit. And then I'll get on my bike and I'll bike around town and hard, you know, it, it's very hilly here where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And so it gives me an opportunity to get off the saddle and, and really pump and do those. And then I'll, and I'll, and I'll get down with either weights or I'll do body weight exercises and do those things. So I think all of those things, and then chastity is fantastic at making me really good, high protein, high fat meals. Um, very much. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm cyclical keto. I don't live in keto, but yep. I very much know when I've got ketones rocking and I'll use exogenous ketones to help get me into state when I need to. 
when I feel like it's going to be important. Speaking of that, have has, has there been any further collaboration between you guys and HVMN? Has that conversation continued? It 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 has, but we are on a um, we're on. Let's meet at the next at the Asprey's event coming up in September, and let's let's play hard when we get there so that we can take a look. So what I'm doing right now is formulating some drink stuff that works very well with their with their ketone ester drink. So yeah, you're gonna. Oh, I'm, I can't wait! I can't wait to get some in your hands because you're on my prototype list. So very um, exciting, super hacker. Um, and yeah, there's some there's some other stuff that I'm doing with that also. Uh, with our power solution, I really can't wait to get in your hands as a as a thing to get people f- over that hurdle that may be the thing that the the hurdle of disbelief, right? That a lot of people have, like like it's kind of that one more rep thing. Like like how do you get without doing smelling salts or without doing <laughs> right right yeah. without hyping yourself up with 600 milligrams of caffeine? How do you get through that thing that it's going to result in a sustainable lifestyle changing? physiological behavior and build, right? Like you're still looking great. Um, I, I don't know if you're still doing, uh, what's your, what's your, what would you call your training routine that you do today? Are you still? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I get asked that on occasion and I just, this isn't a really helpful answer, but I just say, I listen to my body. And just because I've been doing it for so long and I understand the different components of, you know, you got to prioritize recovery and sleep and nutrition is all going to play into how you want to look and, you know, different exercises, of course, but really I just wake up and I think, okay, what do I feel like doing today? And so it's some combination of, you know, like we did legs today. Um, and you know, I don't typically go to a gym anymore, like here in, um, uh, Minnesota, I'm everything's outside. So I'm grounded the whole time We're we're moving stones where we're doing lunges up the hills and, so it's all functional type movements is, is how I would describe it. it. Oh, Nick, I, 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 so I used to live when I, when I was in the air force, um, I would, I would, uh, drive, I had a little Porsche 914 and a 240 Z. Right. So I, I, cause you know, you got to drive a cool car when you're in the military. Right. Yep. And they were, you know, they were cheap pieces of shit that, you know, they <laughs> ran good enough to be okay. Um, and I would either take my hang glider up to Mariposa, the Hills of Mariposa, and I would hang glide, like I would do, I would do it all day long until the sunset, right? Or I would go to Yosemite and I would free climb half dome, right? So I'm just, I'm doing, you know, not, not, what's his name? Who's, who's a kid, Alex Arnold's or whatever, that, that crazy kid that, that climbed half dome at night, like one day, crazy stuff, man. But, um, but I would free climb. I loved free climb. I love to spider monkey up a, up a, you know, hill and, and get back, um, you know, and then, or, or motorcycle road race or those things. And I think it's really important that we find that combination of like, I guarantee you enjoy doing those training routines that are novel, interesting, tilting a, a, a boulder right over is such a great fun challenge. Yes. And it also looks cool. Like there's all these aspects to it, right? Like, please, somebody catch this on video for me. Yeah, <laughs> which I do. I, I hired a content creator. He's he's living with me. He's traveling with me. Yes. Love it. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. And the, and the other is is the appreciating the outcome. Like when we're, you know, it's funny when you're young, um, you look for the challenge. You look for the pain. You look for the right for you know killing it at you know, for, for personal best on, you know, at a, on a training day. And as you get older, like, you know, me being an old guy, right. As you look older, you, it's funny because the, there's a, there's this differential back then, give me the freaking pain, right? Now it's how do I get the level of performance and, and have the, the pain level not be so high that I don't want to do that thing. Right. Because you start to get, you know, and thankfully I, I know, you know, how to, how to do stuff that, that can, you know, combat some of that stuff, call a genius and those things. Boom. Um, <laughs> is it's really important to, to kind of balance out that, that pain ROI, you know, return on the investment of that exercise. And also like, I was just, I was just watching um, Arnold the other day. Right. And now he says, I only do cable weights now at 70 years old or 72 or whatever it is. Because I only do cable weights now because I know that my my you know my penchant will be to take the heaviest weights possible 
and to push them the hardest way. And I know that that's going to cause a problem at one point. Mm -hmm. And then I won't be able to do a bench or I won't be able to do curls or I won't be able to do leg extensions or, you know, or a hack squat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. That's something super important uh, that I've been talking about recently is there's this common misconception that in order to have the the physique that you want or what, whatever, that you have to spend like an hour in the gym killing yourself and it has to suck. Just absolutely not the case. Like the workout we did today was no longer than a half hour and it was killer. And what I also recommend entrepreneurs do is sprinkle movement throughout your day. Absolutely. Instead of of going to the gym for an hour, you can instead live an active lifestyle. So during your work breaks, go outside, do some pushups. You know, Right, yep. what I'm doing right now, a standing workstation. Like your your default state should be movement. Absolutely, Have like a, a, a pull up bar uh, at your door. So every time you go in and out of the door, do some pull ups. Like it doesn't have to be the structured, specific sets and reps. Just move your body. Right. I've got a, I've got a pull up bar leg lift station right downstairs. As soon as I'm done this, I've got another podcast coming up after this. As soon as I'm done there, I'm going to go do, I'm going to, I'm going to go do the twists. I'm going to turns. I'm going to do as many pull-ups as I can. I'm going to do right. And, and the thing is when you start integrating like that, I think you really said it well, when you start integrating like that, meaning that motion is the dominant state that we're in on a regular basis, the sense of fun comes back. Yes. A lot of time we're so used to being sedentary especially entrepreneurs, we're sitting at our computer for hours a day, right? The majority of our day, how do you make that so that it's an active dynamic event? Like, you you know what the Pomodoro technique is for you, right? Yes, I love that. (laughs) That's what I say during your Pomodoro breaks, get some movement in. Oh yeah. If you want your, if you like for me, when I was, when I was trying to optimize nootropics is I was going, gosh, what are the variables that make this happen? What do I do? Well, it's one of two conditions, either mo- movement, right? Blood flow. So you get the blood brain barrier passage or power nap. So I can't take, if I take more than two power nap, if I take two more than two meditations a day, then my sleep is going to be effective negatively. Yep. So the majority of it is going to be a five minute kick-ass fun workout. Mark Sisson, who is a little bit older than I am. Dude, it's right? crushing it. Oh yeah. And he's just, he goes, he goes, dude, he goes, quit thinking you got to go and do five sets of 15 to be a brute. Go do one set, go back to work, do another set. You'll have five sets at the end of the day. I assure you, you're going to see, right. You're going to see the results. I mean, it's, yeah. So yes. killer stuff. Man. Okay. So I, I know you got to hop off. Let's do some rapid fire questions on these, the, the products that you create, right? Newtopia awesome. brand. So I love it. First off, what makes Newtopia different than other Everything, one size fits all? I, I love it. Two, two, two primary things, probably a third in the end is one is everything is customized and personalized to you as an individual. We don't ship. There's nothing sitting in our inventory in a warehouse that we're shipping out from some third party. We make it for you based on the input that you give us on what you're looking to accomplish, what state you want to get into. That's one. So customized, personalized nootropics. Two is every nootropic is a full stack. It's not a nootropic. You're going to have to add 20 or 30 different things to, to make it effective. It's got an antioxidant. It's got an adaptogen, right? And a stack of antioxidants, a stack of adaptogens, a stack of B vitamins. It's got a choline donor. It's got the nootropic. It's got vitamin D, K. It's got all of these components that are critical to the performance of that nootropic and the optimization of the state that you're trying to accomplish with that specific nootropic. And then the last thing would be that each of these stacks has millions of inputs now from all of our customers and our clients and our beta prototype um, customers uh, that have helped us to continue to refine. We are not, this is not a static product. Not only is it customized and optimized to you, but every month I go through these products and I say, what is a new extraction or compound or process of extraction or compounding that will make this a better product? So they continue to get better. Yep. So it's not just customized once. Each subsequent no. order gets better and better and better. Absolutely. Love that. Which the answer to that question answers this question, which is what I tell people. Why are they so expensive compared to these brands <laughs> like Alpha Brain and Qualia? It is no, that no, customization. I, and I love that. Yeah. It's a, 
So um, one, you don't have to take seven caps to, to uh, <laughs> complete it. <laughs> that was a Schmachten brother jab. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, the, other, the other is, is that it does that customization and that process and the handholding, like you're going to hear from our customer service crew. They're going to give you a call or an email or both to make sure that you're getting the outcome that you want out of these things. And if you're not, besides a 365-day, 100% guarantee, like refund, no problem. But the other is, we want you to have the outcomes. We want you to achieve the performance that we're able to achieve. We want you to have that superhuman. We believe in and we live by the sick to superhuman protocol. We understand what it's like to live there. It is, I was, again, I should have been roadkill when I was young. And then after, after Accutane, I should have been roadkill again. And I've had two, I've had, I've had over the last two years, I've had five key people in my life, family and mentors pass away. And I am at a higher performance now than I was then. Not because I'm, I'm, you know, immune to it. I feel it as much or more than anyone, but because I've got tools and I understand how to use those tools to get me to the next level. Again, my calling is to make a monumental contribution to every life I touch. And that is something that I can't back away from. So I better get better, man. Yep. I, I tell people, once you feel the Newtopia difference, you're not going to think they're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. How, how, how expensive is it running on, you know, on having half the cylinders in your V8 engine, right? Suck. It's very expensive to run suboptimal or sick. You start running at optimal, super optimal, and superhuman, everything changes. Everything. Yep. So anyway, yeah. Last question. Tell us about this magical little container here. Call a oh, genius. This? Oh, I've this? been hooked on this stuff. <laughs> Isn't it delicious? It's delicious and it's super effective with those <laughs> concentrations of adaptogenic mushrooms. I love it. I love it. So we built that as a baseline. Um, when Matt was going through his own recovery, post drug and alcohol addiction, he was looking for something to get his brain back. He noticed that after like 30 days, 90 days, 120 days, he, the addiction side of it was gone, but the performance side was lagging quite a bit. And as a guy that was a personal trainer to the stars, right? He knew what feeling awesome could feel like. Mm -hmm. So he said, Hey, Mark, why don't you start playing with with lion's mane, okay, which is a huge BDNF, brain-derived nootrophic factor enhancer. Yep. And so I started working with that, and that became kind of the core of going, hold it. If we could increase, and this is what happened to Matt, Matt started taking mega doses, like six grams a day, 10 grams a day, 11 grams a day of lion's mane, which can be kind of hard on the gut, thanks to the fact that Bioptimizers is great at gut stuff. Um, I said gut stuff, not butt stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's the private, uh, private products. Yeah. Not yeah, released yeah. Yet. Off, uh, yeah. Yeah. Those are off label. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so essentially um, it made a man monumental difference to him when he started doing that. So we started working on it saying, hold it. What are the components that make the mushroom so powerful? And so we, we have four mushrooms in there. We have red ratio and we have shaga, right. And, and, um, and, and lion's mane and, and, um, cordyceps. and cordyceps. And, and what we did is we started extracting those. And as we extracted them, and we got them more and more dense molecules, the, cr the critical molecules in them had a chocolatey kind of, of taste and, and smell to them. And Chastity, my partner in crime on this, she said, hey, I know how to make this into something beautiful and wonderful and super effective. So she made it into this absolutely incredible she just took and leveraged the already chocolatey notes of the of the mushrooms and made it richer and better mouthfeel and and even amplified a number of the characteristics potentiated it as a result we created an os for your system so this is an os for your brain an operating system for your brain you take this it does a bunch of repair it helps to do the bdnf helps to have neurogenesis create neurogenesis or spur neurogenesis the creation of new brain cells the blooms of new brain cells mm -hmm. that you get to program right we can fix your brain you can make it more elastic and then the neurotropics the neutopia neurotropics you can put those on top and say ah that's much easier to get to the state 
and it's much more sustainable, right? So anyhow, it's great, great product. I love it as well. I'm a, I do it in my, my morning. Uh, when I do coffee, I do it in my coffee. When I don't do coffee, I do it as a wonderful cold drink in the morning. And uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah, it can be a nice little coffee uh, alternative. So absolutely awesome. Mr. Newts, thank you so much for coming on for round two of the podcast. <laughs> Appreciate you. Very excited to uh, be the guinea pig for future products. Oh, you know it, brother. Yeah. You know it, brother. Hey, um, also don't let's um let's do another one. I would love to dive deeper into the entrepreneurship. I, I'd love to talk about bootstrapping with your 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 customers, your clients, and and your viewers yeah. and listeners. I'd love to talk about um the mistakes that I've made yeah, on the way to, to building and selling companies. Um, would love to talk about the the shitty things I've done yeah, on the way up and also the the ways to repair those. And also some of the incredible relationships I've had with mentors and partners in business, how to make good mm. decisions on that and how to avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. Mm. I also want to talk to you about uh, operations because I heard you on the, the your recent Luke Story podcast, how you're really good at the, the beginning, you're really good at the, the selling, <laughs> but the operations in the middle, that's something that I'm struggling with too. So, oh, dude. Yeah. Oh, no, it's great. It's great. It's great struggle, brother. And it,